Well, welcome this morning. Thank you. Um, we um, are in the, we're, I think we'll finish the book of 2 Samuel today. We'll, I think we'll probably finish the book of 2 Samuel today. I had a comment, uh, I, I chatted about the Bible study with, um, with some pastors and I said, you know what I've, I've read these books before, but my my general um, synopsis summary of of Second Samuel is David's not as good as guy as we think. Yeah. There's there's, there's you know I, I remember when when Jesus is born, it's the city of David, you know the the king of all kings, and how much he's lifted up. And then I'm like, but in the whole story, there's not a whole lot that's redeemable from. <laughs> David just continually, continually is a, is a bit of a, I'm going to call him a scoundrel only because the third word of the chapter we're starting on use the word scoundrel about somebody else. But what chapter is it that we're starting on? 20, chapter 20. Okay, time. I couldn't remember if it was the end of 19 or if it was 20. So there's been, you know, we we just got through with, um the David and and Absalom and all the sort of infighting between David and his and his son. Um and um I believe Absalom was killed. Um and then um David had to run away, but Absalom gets killed and he finally returns and um the he's restored to kingship in Jerusalem, but there's he also mourns and there's a lot of stuff going on. So, oh. and so we are in the one of the one of the one of the things I was saying with a with a clergy friend of mine was, um, you know, we out, outside of David and Goliath, you know, we have David being anointed king, but then running away continually from Saul and nearly being killed by Saul. And then the whole David and Bathsheba mess. Yeah. And and then the thing with his with his daughter with Tamar, it's just there's no way to there was no way to sugarcoat that. It was it's such a so much of the story is just so horrible. You know, his his daughter gets raped by her by his son, his other sons mostly cover it up he covers it up one of the sons gets mad absalom gets mad kills all the other sons so david has no other heirs david kills absalom's son so he has no heirs in retaliation like it's they go to war against each other all because this rape was covered up and not i mean it's just oh it's so messy yes yes anyway I, I remember, you know, six chapters later thinking, you know, all they could have been at peace this whole time if they had just done justice by the rape that happened. Oh. But but they didn't. Instead, they killed a bunch of people uh, of each other. So we are in chapter 20. Now a scoundrel, I love how you, the first time we hear about someone, it's now a scoundrel named Sheba, son of Betri, a Benjamite happened to be there. He sounded the trumpet and cried out, We have no portion in David, no share in the son of Jesse. Everyone to your tents, O Israel. Um, so David has returned to, to Jerusalem, but but remember that um before that for a while, um um Absalom was there as the king, and there's sort of infighting and bickering among the tribes of Israel. Um, so I'm assuming this is somebody who was in the court and supported Absalom, but not but not David. Um, so all the people of Israel withdrew from David and followed Sheba, son of Betri, but the people of Judah followed their king steadfastly from the Jordan to Jerusalem. David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took the ten concubines who he had left to look after the house. 
uh, and put them in a house under guard and provided for them, but did not go into them. So they were shut up until the day of their death, living as, as if in widowhood. Wow. So. Doesn't give any reason for that. No, it doesn't. The 10 concubines who were left to look in the house, he, he put them in a house under guard and did not go into them. And they, that's, that's how they lived the rest of their days in one house with each other. And that was it. Hmm. Huh. No, it doesn't. Then the king, well, I'm trying to see. Maybe it says in my. Oh. So my. It says David arrests the 10 concubines claimed by Absalom during his revolt. So maybe it's to punish them for supporting Absalom while he was exiled from from there i don't know house arrest okay uh then the king said to amasa call the men of judah together to me within three days and be here yourself so amasa went to summon judah but he delayed beyond the set time that had been appointed to him david said to abishai now sheba son of Bichri will do us more harm than absalom take your lord's servants and pursue him or you'll find fortified cities for himself and escape from us so he's he's concerned that this uprising is going to be even worse than Absalom, who had several of the tribes on his side, um, because it's taken too long to muster up an army. Joab's men went out after him, along with the Cherethites, the Perethites, and all the warriors. They went out from Jerusalem to pursue Sheba son of Bichri. When they were at the large stone that is in Gibeon, Amasa came to meet them. Now Job was wearing a soldier's garment, and over it was a belt with a sword and its sheath fastened at its waist. And as he went forward, it fell out. Job said to Amasa, Is it well with you, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. But Amasa did not notice the sword in Joab's hand. Joab struck him in the belly so that his entrails poured out on the ground, and he died. He did not strike a second blow. So... Amasa was asked, I'm just, I'm putting this together. So Amasa was asked by David to go put an army together and he didn't, or he didn't do it quickly enough. And then David sent out Joab, another one of his, so Joab killed Amasa for not getting the army together quick enough, I guess. Um, I don't know. Um, sorry, my phone was dinging. Um, hmm. So then Joab and his brother Abishai pursued Sheba son of Bishri. And so maybe the implication is Amasa was asked to help and he was actually not helping he was he went out and betrayed david or something i don't know i'm assuming that's what they that's why that happened then joab and his brother abishai pursued sheba son of bishri and one of joab's men took his stand by amasa and said whoever favors joab and whoever is for david let him follow joab amasa lay wallowing in his blood on the highway and the man saw that all the people were stopping since he saw that all who came by were stopping, he carried Amasa from the highway into a field and threw a garment over him. Once he was removed from the highway, all the people went on after Joab to pursue Sheba, son of Bishri. So everybody was stopping. Instead of instead of running to help Joab, they were like, well, who's this dying in the road? Interesting. Um, Sheba passed through all the tribes of Israel to Abel of Beth Makkah, and all the Beatrites assembled and followed him inside. Joab's forces came and besieged him in Abel of Beth Makkah. 
They threw up a siege ramp against the city, and it stood against the rampart. Joab's forces were battering the walls to break it down. Then a wise woman called from the city, listen, listen, tell Joab, come here, I want to speak with you." to you. He came near her, and the woman said, are you Joab? He answered, I am. Then she said to him, listen to the words of your servant. He answered, I am listening. And she said, they used to say in the old days, let them inquire at Abel's, and, and so they would settle a matter. I'm one of those who are peaceable and faithful in Israel. You seek to destroy a city that is a mother in Israel. Why will you swallow up the heritage of the Lord? Joab answered, far be it from me, far be it that I should swallow up or destroy. This is not the case. But a man of the hill country of Ephraim called Sheba, son of Bishri, has lifted up his hand against King David. Give him up alone and I will withdraw from the city. The woman said to Joab, his head will be thrown over the wall to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think I'm going to have a nightmare. <laughs> then, the, <laughs> then the woman went to all the people with her wise plan. And they cut off the head of Sheba, son of Bishri, and threw it out to Joab. So he blew the trumpet, and they dispersed from the city, and all went to their homes, while Joab returned to Jerusalem to the king. Wow, get the city to be on your side. and Because uh, he had an army in there too, but apparently all you have to do is cut the head of the leader. And now Joab was in command of all the army of Israel. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, was in command of the Cherethites and the Pelethites. Adoram was in charge of the forced labor. Jehoshaphat, son of Ahilud, was the recorder. Sheba was secretary. Zadok and Abiathar were priests. And Ira the Jairite were also, was also David's priest. One thing I, I said, uh, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, um, one of the reasons that they name all the, the groups and the tribes and individuals has to do with well, it has to do with stuff we don't we don't understand now, but it's giving giving families and tribes credit later on, right? So they they read this five hundred years later and they say, "Oh, I'm a terrified. Look, I helped the king, right? My tribe helped the king, or my ancestor was part of, or to punish them in some cases. Those people were against the king, right? But it's it's a sort of as they're telling the story, it's like, you know, there's uh, someone's from Wisconsin in this group and say, you know, those people from Wisconsin, they can't be trusted, you know, <laughs> right? It's telling the story, but adding in the history for that people would understand. Um, so, David avenges the Gibeonites. Um, so there's, I'm going to just read the, my note on this in my Bible, because some of this is hard to understand. David put seven sons and grandsons of Saul to death to avert a famine caused by blood guilt result, resulting from Saul's slaughter of the Gibeonites. So remember Saul and, and David, you know, Saul was the king. David was anointed to be the king, and they've been, even though Saul's dead, they've been, you know, they've been, the, the, they're still people that are loyal to Saul and people loyal to David, and they've been sort of infighting on the side for a while. Now, there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year, <clears throat> and David inquired of the Lord. The Lord said there was blood guilt on Saul and on his house because he put the Gibeonites to death. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not a part of the people of Israel, but of the remnant of Amorites. Although the people of Israel had sworn to spare them, Saul had tried to wipe them out in his zeal for the people of Israel and Judah. David said to the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? How shall I make expiation that you may bless the heritage of the Lord? The Gibeonites said to him, it is not a matter of silver or gold between us and, and Saul or his house. Neither is for us to put anyone to death in Israel. He said, what do you say that I should do for you? They said to the king, the man who consumed us and planned to destroy us so that we should have no place in all the territory of Israel. Let seven of his sons be handed over to us and we will impale them before the Lord at Gibeon on the mountain of the Lord. The king said, I will hand them over. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Saul's son, Jonathan, because of the oath of the Lord that was between them between jo David and Jonathan, son of Saul. The king took the two sons of Rizpah, daughter of Aiyah, whom she bore to Saul, 
Armoni and Mephibosheth and the five sons of Merab, daughter of Saul, whom she bore to Adriel, son of Barzillai, the, the Holothite. He gave them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they impaled them on the mountain before the Lord. The seven of them perished together. They were put to death in the first days of harvest at the beginning of the barley harvest. Then Rizpah, the daughter of Aia, took sackcloth and spread it on a rock for herself from the beginning of the harvest until rain fell on them from the heavens. She did not allow the birds of the air to come on the bodies by day or wild animals by night. When David was told that Rizpah, daughter of Aia, the concubine of Saul, had done, David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan from the people of Jabesh Gilead, who had stolen them from the public square of Bethshan, where the Philistines had hung them up. On the day the Philistines killed Saul at Gilboa, he brought up from there the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan, and they gathered the bones of those that who had been impaled. They buried the bones of Saul and of his son Jonathan in the land of Benjamin and Zela, in the tomb of his father Kish. They did all that the king commanded. After that, God heeded supplications for the land. So one thing that's a cultural thing, and it's a cultural thing in a lot of cultures, that to have your body be killed and just expose the elements was, even in multiple cultures, was um, a, a fate worse than death, right? And so the seven sons of Saul, seven children of Saul are killed but left out to be exposed to birds and animals of prey and all this. Mm -hmm. As were Saul and Jonathan's bodies. Mm -hmm. So when David sees that the mother of one of the seven that was killed is not letting the animals get to them, is just standing there protecting the bodies, David does the right thing and gives them a proper burial puts them underground including Saul and Jonathan and remember Jonathan had been his friend yeah so you know once in a while once in a while David does the right thing <laughs> uh, but then that last little statement God heeded supplication for the land meaning I'm assuming the drought ended then so they still tied those things to to the drought um, I always find that interesting, like, the, the, the word of God, how, how did that word of God come to David? It said the word of God came to David that it was because of the Gibeonites that, that they were having this drought. Um, it's not that I doubt that the word of God happened, but yeah. it, I, I just, I have a hard, it does, it didn't say that God said you need to kill these, these seven people, but. But David asked the Gibeonites, what do you want me to do? And yeah. I just don't, I don't know if I believe that God requests the death of people for for better weather. Yeah, yeah, no, it, that doesn't make any sense from our Christian point of view. But then a whole lot of what happens in the Old Testament, especially all that we've been reading through Samuel, um, doesn't jive with what I know about God. There's so much of um, an eye for an eye. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you kill them, so we'll kill you. Well, then, right. but you kill them, so we'll kill you. And it just goes back and forth. When Right, right. Well, pretty all, soon, all, all of them are dead. Right. Uh, what's the, the phrase? An eye for an eye just makes the whole world blind. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I hadn't heard that, but it's true. Yeah. Um, the good news is as soon as we finish this part of this chapter, it's all poetry left and prayer. Good, because I'm tired of Samuel. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Philistines went to war again with Israel and and the Philistines, of course. And David went down together with his servants. They fought against the Philistines, and David grew weary. Ishbi Benab, one of the descendants of the giants whose spear weighed 300 shekels of bronze and who was fitted out with new weapons said he would kill David. But Abishai, son of Zeruiah, came to his aid and attacked the Philistine and killed him. Then David's men swore to him, you shall not go out with us to battle any longer so that you do not quench the lamp of Israel. After So the same 
people of Goliath were this were 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 this were this group too. When they say giants, we're not talking about fifty feet tall. We're talking about seven feet tall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big men. Yeah. Especially in that period when, you know, probably the the average Israelite was you know five foot four. You know, so a seven footer would be pretty yeah. astounding. Um. Uh, after this, a battle took place with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sibekai the Hushatite killed Saph, who was one of the descendants of the giants. Then there was another battle with the Philistines at Gob, and Elhanan, son of Jari Oregim, the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath the Hittite, the Gittite, another Goliath, uh, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. There was again war at Gath, where there was a man of great size, who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. 24 in number. He too was descended from the giants. When he taunted Israel, David, Jonathan's son of David, brother, David's brother Shimei killed him. These four were descended from the giants in Gath. They fell by the hands of David and his servants. Interesting. A series of victories by David's men over Philistines descended from the giants. Uh, it says probably an ancient guild of warriors. Anyway. The rest of Second Samuel shifts a little bit here. Um, part of an interesting thing I read this earlier. Um, part of this, uh, there's a couple things here. Uh, part of this is actually also in Psalm 18. Oh. Um, so when we say some of the Psalms were written by David or by Solomon. This is part, if, you, if we were to look at Psalm 18, part of this is almost word for word for Psalm 18. Oh. Um, but it's preserved here. So I'll read the very first part of um, the first three verses of Psalm 18 real quick. Uh, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God, my rock, in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. And here we have, David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, my rock, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my savior, you save me from violence. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. I am saved from my enemies. It's not exactly the same, but it's pretty close. Uh -huh. So basically, you know, it was written down in two places and over time translations and stuff, they they're treated like two separate books. So I got yeah. Basically, it's the same as Psalm 18. For the waves of death encompassed me, the torrents of perdition assailed me, the cords of shale entangled me, the snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord, to my God I called. From his temple he heard my voice, and my cry came to his ears. Then the earth reeled and rocked, the foundations of the heavens trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He was seen upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness around him a canopy, thick clouds, a gathering of water. Out of the brightness before him, coals of fire flamed forth. The Lord thundered from heaven. The Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundation of the world were laid bare at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. He reached from on high, he took me, he drew me out of mighty waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. It came upon me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me out into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He recompensed me, for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. 
for all his ordinances were before me, and from his statutes I did not turn aside. I was blameless before him, and I kept myself from guilt. Therefore the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his sight. I want to say that's twice if David is writing this, he's saying, I've always been clean and blameless in all of this. And I'm like, I don't know. I I did I just read a lot of what you did. Yeah, yeah. I I don't know. Um with with the loyal, you show yourself loyal. With the blameless, you show yourself blameless. With the pure, you show yourself pure, and with the crooked, you show yourself perverse. You deliver a humble people, but your eyes are upon the haughty to bring them down. Indeed, you are my lamp, O Lord. The Lord lightens my darkness. By you I can crush a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The promise of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all who take refuge in him. But who is God but the Lord, and who is a rock except our God? The God has girded me with strength. He has opened wide my path. He made my feet like the feet of deer and set me secure on the heights. He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have given me the shield of your salvation, and your help has made me great. You have made me stride freely, and my feet do not slip. I pursued my enemies and destroyed them, and I, I did not turn back until they were consumed. I consumed them and struck them down so that they did not rise. They fell under my feet. For you girded me with strength for the battle. You made my assailants sink under me. You made my enemies turn their backs to me, those who hated me, and I destroyed them. They looked, but there was no one to save them. They cried to the Lord, but he did not answer them. I beat them fine like the dust of the earth. I crushed them and stamped them down like the mire of the streets. I want to say, before I finish this thing, I think... We people have have said this thing where, well, God, the God of the Old Testament, is a mean God who who strikes people down and and you know asks for death. I I don't I don't believe that God changes from the Old to the New Testament. Yes, through Jesus, uh, God understands what it's like to be human, but what I think does happen is. People use their the the filter of what they need and what they want as how they look at God, right? Mm -hmm. And so you had this time of um, instability and and multiple tribes claiming leadership in multiple ways, and and you know tribes overthrowing tribes because they didn't like them, and kings overthrowing kings because they felt like it. And just all this instability. And and so here he's saying, well, God was with me and God helped me kill my enemy. I'm not saying God wasn't with him, but we ask of God what we want of God. Yeah. You know, and I I will firmly say I always I believe God has got a peace. Um, but if if your desire, if 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 you need to believe that God is on your side to defeat your enemies, then then that that's just was the because of the context of what what they were going through. Yeah. Um. There was no, in a way, in a weird way, when the temple is built, it wasn't just that they were kind of ruled by the Greeks and the later the Romans. When the temple is built and the Babylonians, for that matter, when the temple is built, they have this sort of stability in the, the nation the people have a stability because you know the the it's it's one place it's one thing the temple is sort of even though it's not the same as the palace of the kings it 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 changes their thinking to be we're not nomadic anymore we are we are not multiple groups multiple tribes we are one people with one temple so in a, i think in a way establishing the temple was more was not as much about Yes, it was about worship, but it was also about unifying the people. Yeah. yeah. Because we talked about how they sort of fought over the control of the Ark of the Covenant, and they fought over rulership and kingship. And once there is a temple, then they sort of are forced to recognize that they are all one people. Yeah. So. Yeah. That was uh, good for them. They needed that, yeah. 
So in verse 44, you delivered me from strife with the peoples. You kept me as the head of the nations. People whom I had not known served me. Foreigners came cringing to me. As soon as they heard of me, they obeyed me. Foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of their strongholds. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock and exalted be my God, the rock of my salvation. The God who gave me vengeance and brought down peoples under me, who brought me out from my enemies. You exalted me above my adversaries. You delivered me from the violent. For this I will extol you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing praises to your name. He is a tower of salvation for his king, and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. Um, all this time that you've been reading through that, I've been looking at Psalm 18. Yeah. And it's almost totally word for word. Yeah, there's a few spots. Yeah, where they translated it a little differently. The word, word here or there has been. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, and, and that that lends credence. Like some people say, well, all the Psalms were written by David and Solomon. I'm like, well, that's probably not true. Um, only because we, we can tell that they were written over a really long span of time. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, in a way, it's like the letters of Paul. You know, there are 14 letters that are attributed to Paul, but some of them we know were written by later yeah. generations. Yeah. Um, it's sort of, the Psalms are sort of written by or attributed to or in honor of mm -hmm. David and Solomon, mm -hmm. but probably not all written by. Yeah, David. right. Um, so, and, and this, this is sort of proof in a way if Second Samuel, if this is definitely David who's writing Second Samuel, it's proof that at least David wrote that one. <laughs> yeah. But probably quite a few more. Yeah. Um, that was interesting. Though. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we are. Uh, we might. We might not finish today. We'll see. Um. The rest of the book is sort of a little different from what we've done so far. So um, now these are the last words of David, the oracle of David, son of Jesse, the oracle of the man whom God exalted, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the favorite, favorite of the strong one of Israel. The spirit of the Lord speaks through me. His word is upon my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, one who rules over people justly, ruling in the fear of God, is like the light of morning, like a sun rising on a cloudless morning, gleaning from the rain on the grassy land. Is not my house like this with God, for he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. Will he not cause to prosper all my help and my desire? Um, but the godless are all like thorns that are thrown away, for they cannot be picked up with a hand. To touch them, one uses an iron bar or the shaft of a spear, and they are entirely consumed in fire on the spot. Um, okay, so um, this next thing is a little... Um, how do I put this? It's like um, some of the characters we're going that are mentioned in this next section are have already been in the story so basically it's talking about the ones the 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 generals and the people that fought for david oh. and it's sort of a, a recap of and those that sort of defended and helped um help david in his time as a ruler of the of the people so I say that because there are so many hard names in here, but here we go. Let me loosen up my tongue. Yeah. <laughs> uh, these are the names of the warriors whom David had. Josheb, Basebeth, uh, Tachemonite. He was chief of the three. He wielded his spear against 800 whom he killed at one time. Next to him were the three warriors. Uh, next to him among the three warriors was Eleazar, son of Dodo, son of Ahohai. He was with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle. The Israelites withdrew, but he stood his ground. He struck down the Philistines until his arm grew weary, though his hand clung to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. 
but the people came back to him, but only to strip the dead. Next to him was Shema, son of Adji, the Herorite. The Philistines gathered together at Lehi, where there was a plot of ground full of lentils, and the army fled from the Philistines. But he took his stand in the middle of the plot, defended it, and killed the Philistines. And the Lord brought about a great victory. Toward the beginning of harvest, three of the thirty chiefs went down to join David at the cave of Adullam, while a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then at Bethlehem. David said longingly, Oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem that is by the gate. Then the three warriors broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, and brought it to David. But he would not drink of it. He poured it out to the Lord. For he said, The Lord forbid that I should do this. Can I drink the, the blood of the men who went at the risk of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. The three warriors did these things. Um, I don't understand that at all. Well, he was just wanted the water, but he says, "Well, these guys risked their lives for it." I'm and I stayed back. I'm not worthy to drink that water. I guess <sighs> that you just he risked your life. Thank for. you. He couldn't yeah. say thank you to them. Right. Exactly. He, <laughs> Um, now Abishai, son of Zeruiah, the brother of Joab, was chief of the 30. With his spear, he fought against 300 men and killed them, and won a name besides the three. He was the most renowned of the 30 and became their commander, but he did not attain to the three. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, was a valiant warrior from Kabziel, a doer of great deeds. He struck down two sons of Ariel of Moab. He also went down and killed a lion in a pit on a day when the snow had fallen. And he killed an Egyptian, a handsome man. The Egyptian had a spear in his hand. But Benaiah went against him with the staff, snatched the spear out of the Egyptian's hand, and killed him with his own spear. Such were the things that Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, did, and won a name beside the three warriors. He's renowned among the thirty, but did not attain to the three. And David put him in charge of his bodyguard. Here we go. <sighs> among the thirty were Asahel, brother of Joab, Elhanan, son of Dodo of Bethlehem, Shema of Herod, Elika of Herod, Helez the Paltite, Ira, son of Ikesh the Tekoa, uh, Beazar of Anathoth, Mebunai the Hushathite, Zalman the Ahotite, Maharai of Netopha, Heleb, son of Bana of Netopha, Ittai, son of Ribai of Gebeah of the Benjaminites, Benai of Pirathon, Hidai of the Torrents of Gash, Abi Alban the Arbathite, Asmaveth of Bahurim, Eliaba of Shalban, the sons of Jashan, Jonathan, son of Shama the Hararite, Ahiam, son of Sharar the Hararite, Eliphelet, the son of Ahazbai of Makkah, Eliam, son of Ahithopel the Gilanite, Hezro of Carmel, Parai the Arbite, Egal, son of Nathan of Zobah, Bani the Gadite, Zelek the Ammonite, Naharai of, Belo, of Beroth, the armor bearer of Joab, son of Zuriah, Ira the Ithite, Gerab the Ithite, Ithrite, and Uriah the Hittite, 37 in all. So he's listing essentially his, his top soldiers. Yeah. He sort of had this hierarchy among his he had generals below them. He had these these other three, and below them he had thirty seven. Um, that... well, we're also keeping count of how many there are because that makes him a big man. Right. All these people that that did um, that followed David. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, a lot of names. <laughs> And you get an A for surviving saying all of that. <laughs> well, we're going to finish this last chapter. Good. Uh, and then we will be done with Second Samuel, which was hard to read in points. But that's good. Um, again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Again, the anger of the Lord <laughs> was kindled against Israel. We've heard this before. Yeah. And he incited David against them, saying, Go count the people of Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab and the commander of the army who were with him, Go through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, and take a census of the people. So 
so I may know how many there are. But Joab said to the king, May the Lord your God increase the number of the people a hundredfold, while the eyes of my lord the king can still see it. But why does my lord the king want to do this? But the king's word prevailed against Joab and the commanders of the army. So Joab, Joab doesn't understand why you want to make a census. Why do you want to count everybody? Yeah. So Joab and the commander of the army went out and from the presence from the presence of the king to take a census of the people of Israel. They crossed the Jordan and began from Aurora and from the city that is in the middle of the valley toward Gad and on to Jazir. And they came to Gilead and to Kadesh and the land of the Hittites and they came to Dan. And from Dan they went around to Sidon and came to the fortress of Tyre and all the cities of the Hivites and the Canaanites. And they went out to the Negev of Judah at Beersheba. So when they had gone through all the land, they came back to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and 20 days. Joab reported to the king the number of those who had been recorded. And as though there were 800,000 soldiers able to draw the sword, and those of Judah were 500,000. Uh, so, uh, but afterward, David was stricken to the heart because he had numbered the people. It's interesting. Um, knowing a little bit about the about the geography um it's almost like they did the they did the outside edge but not the inside oh. um, and you know that it mentions israel was a tribe and judah was a tribe but it mentioned they were to dan and to bethlehem to um some of the other tribes so i don't know why was he just counting those tribes or or others also um it's interesting yeah and my book my my bible says that hard to hard to interpret the population statistics because it's much too high to correspond, correspond to historical reality oh. um anyway but i'm also wondering why it was why it's sinful to count people anyway yeah david was stricken to the heart because he had numbered his people David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done, but now, O Lord, I pray you, take away the guilt of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. When David rose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, Thus says the Lord, three things I offer you. Choose one of them, and I will do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him, he asked him, Shall three years of famine come to you on your land, or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? So David gave, God gave David three choices to do penance. Three, three years of famine, three months of him running away, or three days of pestilence on the land. And none of them were specifically to him, but to, to everybody, basically. Now yeah. consider, decide what answer I shall return to the one who sent me. Then David said to God, I am in great distress. Let, let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But let me not fall into human hand. So he did the, he chose the third one. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from that morning until the appointed time. And 70,000 of the people died from Dan to Beersheba. But when the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented concerning the evil and said to the angel who was bringing destruction among the people, it is enough, now stay your hand. The angel of the Lord was then by the threshing floor of Arunah the Jebusite. When David saw the angel who was destroying the people, he said to the Lord, I alone have sinned and I alone have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, be against me and against my father's house. So this is, I find this very interesting. I'm, I'm going to say this understanding I live in Roswell. <laughs> okay. Um, it's, what is, what is a pestilence? What is this punishment? Um, it's, really um kind of interesting it's some kind of a plague but what what is it is an illness it's it's interesting but i say that because i've seen you know shows where they say well maybe there's evidence in the bible of 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 extraterrestrials it's interesting when he says he sees the angel um um David saw the verse 17. David saw the angel who was destroying the people. So it's not like everyone just got sick and died over three days. David saw this angel sowing this pestilence. Really interesting if you think about it. Like, 
what did he see? What did he see really? <laughs> um, fascinating. Can I use that for proof that there are aliens? Well, I, I, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't plan on going off this tangent, but I, yeah. Yeah, there are, there are, um, it could be completely coincidental, but there are like thousands of year old like um, drawings and etchings of people wearing helmets. Yeah, yeah. You know, and suits, <laughs> like yeah. space suits. It's like, huh, you know, makes you wonder if it was just creativity or, yeah. or they saw something, you know. A lot of things in this world that we don't understand. For sure, for sure. Well, we are almost done here. Here we go. Um, this is actually, we talked about the temple. This is actually very interesting here for that reason. Uh, the, that day, Gad came to David and said to him, go up and erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arunah the Jebusite. Following Gad's instructions, David went up as the Lord had commanded. When Aru, Arunah looked down, he saw the king and his servants coming toward him. And Aruna went out and prostrated himself before the king with his face in the ground. Aruna said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? David said, To buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord, so the plague may be averted from the people. Then Aruna said to David, Let my lord the king take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering and the threshing sledges and the yokes for the oxen for the wood. All this, O king, Aruna gives to the king. And Arunah said to the king, May the Lord your God respond favorably to you. But the king said to Arunah, No, but I will buy them from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. David built an altar, David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and offerings of well being. So the Lord answered his supplication for the land, and the plague was averted from Israel. We find out later that this place probably becomes the site of the the temple. So the altar is the same altar that is in the middle of the temple once the temple is built. Um, and there's a um, little note here. In the ancient world, the threshing floor was thought to be a, thought of a place where divine power might manifest itself. So the threshing floor is God, God finds God's self on the threshing floor, apparently. Um, so it was a, it was an appropriate um, appropriate place um, to to be. And I, I'm remembering that <laughs> we had the story of um, in Ruth. Remember, there was a, a moment with on the threshing floor where God was present too. Then so. That's interesting. I've never really thought about that, but put two and two together. Oh. So that is the end of Samuel. We are we're gonna go into um the book of Kings, and Kings is written a little differently, for lack of a better term. Um there are some um different kinds of stories, I would say less less war. Thankfully, um, there's there's a, a, a little bit, but it's a di sort of a different, you know, it felt like Samuel was so much with with war. Um, yeah, yeah. Both first and second Samuel. But first and second Kings is um, a variety of of other kinds of, of stories. There are there are some more, but there's a bunch of other things that go on. So um, we'll go through Kings. Um, and it's 11 o'clock. Perfect timing. Very good. Are you still with us, Pat? You follow all that? You're muted now. Yeah. Well, I'm assuming she heard all that, whether or not she... I have no and idea. You... Oh, there, oh, there you are. There you are. Hi, Pat. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, this thing are. mutes on me sometimes. Oh, well, we just let you be. I'm assuming you followed all that. Yes, I've been listening all the way through. 
Well, you both have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very uh, much. You we, too. Will, we will not have Bible study next Thursday. I will be uh, out of town. It's every other week right now, but I promise I'll be back. Okay. I was not here last Thursday. No, I was here last Thursday. I left Thursday afternoon, right? So I didn't, I had a, my Thursday afternoon. Is Pond, how is Panda today? Panda is better. He's, uh, his medications are, he's through his antibiotics. So he's, he's a little better. He's still very sick, but oh. yeah. I didn't know they used antibiotics.